the law. Some of us follow it, other people practice it, and 99% of us have no idea how it works. That ends today, because on this week's podcast, we have a defense lawyer who specializes in white-collar crime. His name's Josh Busson, and he's going to walk us through how jury selection works, what it's like to spar with the government of the United States of America, and most importantly, what's the best lawyer movie, A Few Good Men or My Cousin Vinny? Make sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss one episode of interviews with journalists, fashion designers, even cattle ranch managers. It's Colby Howard Wants Your Job. Let's dive in. Hello, friends, and welcome to Colby Howard Wants Your Job, the show where we find out what the heck everyone else does with their day. I'm your host, Colby Howard, and today we have a very special guest. His name's Josh Busson. He is a lawyer. We'll find out what type of law, what that even means. We have a lot of questions for him, but welcome to the show. So you're a lawyer currently at what firm? I'm guessing it has an ampersand of a ton of names. It has several names, each very important. Morvillo, <laughs> Abramowitz, Grand, Iason, and Anello. And it's been around for 50 plus years. It's been around a while, yeah. Let's start with a very philosophical question. Sure. Why is it that law is grouped into those professions that people go, how did you choose law? Why is it part of the calling, like a doctor? I think, honestly, it's because it's among the default careers if you would like to grow up and be a professional, but you have no idea what you want to do. And so it's not, uh, you never ask an NBA player, what what made you want to get into basketball? Right. They do it because they like it and they're good at Mm -hmm. it. But there are a lot of people who go into law because they want to be a professional and work in a professional area. And so law school seems like as good of a choice as any. How many people do you know don't make it through law school? They thought they wanted to do law, but then they actually realize halfway through they actually don't want to do it. Unfortunately, I think most people figure that out about five to seven years after they start (laughs) practicing. (laughs) Almost everyone uh, makes it through law school. Because it is really, law school is super interesting. I mean, you're reading a lot of interesting cases with the craziest fact patterns, and it, it's very engaging. And then you get out in the real world, and your first couple of years are a pretty drastic shift. And a lot of people realize it's not for them in that stage of their life. Got it. And of all the laws, what, what are all the laws you can practice? Want, oh, I thought no, you were no, going to no, ask sorry. all the laws I know. <laughs> Just <laughs> the whole thing. What are all the laws that you could practice in a nutshell? And maybe there's a ton that I don't know about. I'm guessing it's, and then which one do you practice? So I think you can, at the first step, break it down between litigation and transactional. Litigation generally is either civil or criminal. Civil cases, I'm suing you because you wronged me in some sort of way mm-hmm. and I want you to pay me for it. And criminal is something brought by the government for a violation of the criminal laws. Litigation inherently means you are in the courtroom, like you end up in the court if you're a litigator. Yes. You're a transactional lawyer, you're probably never going to go to court. What you see on television or in the movies Let's dive in. Uh, uh, is uh, litigators. You're never really going to see an M&A lawyer, I mean, maybe a little here and there, but courtroom scenes, all of those are litigators. Well, the only thing you see in movies when it comes to corporate lawyers is a whole table of like 35 people all going, like making it seem like this guy's a big deal. That's That's literally all you see. They don't actually do anything. No, they always walk out single file with about 18 (laughs) of them and they sit on one side. Exactly. And the movie ends because you know the powerful firm took over. Now that we're talking about kind of the movies, movies, that is literally all I have to go off of. I have never been in a courtroom. I have never done jury duty. (laughs) I don't know if that's legal or not, but I have moved around a lot, so maybe they can't find me. Uh, I've I've never not shown up to jury duty. I I think it's really smart to admit that on your own podcast, because this will be a really interesting case for me, should this ever (laughs) go south on you. I don't think we can count this as a privileged conversation, but maybe we'll talk after. Fantastic. Okay, so I've never avoided jury duty, but I still have yet to be called. We might cut this. On advice of counsel, I'm saying I have not been called. (laughs) The only thing I know about why someone ends up in a courtroom, what happens in a courtroom, 
all of that is from the movies and TV shows. Right. That is, and I'm guessing most other people. So if we could walk through soup to nuts, why someone even approaches you saying, hey, I'd like to hire you and maybe particularly you and your area of the world. And then all the way to maybe you settled. Did a judge or jury decide you were guilty? What does guilt even mean? If we could just go through soup to nuts, that would be fascinating. Yeah, sure. So we do mostly white collar criminal defense. We do some other criminal defense from... What does that mean? So sometimes you get gun and drug cases. We serve on a panel that takes on assigned cases every once in a while from the court to take on people who don't have enough money to pay for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so we take on some of those. But the the main business that we do is in white collar criminal defense, which is usually more affluent individuals who have committed some sort of or alleged to have committed some sort of fraud. Individuals, not corporations? Some are corporations. My firm mostly does individuals. There are big, gigantic firms that will represent corporations Mm -hmm. when the government is bringing in criminal action against a corporation, which you can do in the United States. But then like, look, the thing that we all saw was most likely the financial crisis. The people who worked at Goldman, you can never quite tell, are they being charged as Goldman employees or they are just individuals who happen to work at Goldman? So an, an action against an individual is different from an action against the company. A criminal action against a company is almost always going to result in one of two things, either a money payment or some sort of injunction. So you telling the corporation, you must do X, you must do Y. If found guilty. Uh, If found guilty or if they plead guilty. An individual is different. It's always in your personal capacity. You don't get to usually just pay a money fine and move Hmm. on with life. If the U.S. government or a state government is bringing a criminal action against you, jail time is almost always on the table, particularly for the types of crimes that we generally deal with. So what's an example of a, you are working at a company doing what, and you did what, and now they're going after you individually? So a big one is insider trading. Uh, You work at Goldman, you hear about a merger or something like that from a friend who works at that company and you trade on it. mm -hmm. That's material, non-public information, and you have messed up, not Goldman, and Goldman might have too. But you as an individual have broken the law, and that's why the government is coming after you and not the company. They find out in the mail, or do FBI agents show up to their house? You know, you sometimes actually can find out in the mail. You'll get a letter (laughs) saying, you know, uh, we're investigating this matter. We're going to subpoena you to testify or provide documents. And a lot of times clients come to us in that investigation phase. So soup to nuts, Mm -hmm. as you say. The client finds out they're under investigation or they know that the government is investigating because they heard from other people who had talked to the government that they're looking into something and they call us. And a lot of our job is often not, you don't even get to the courtroom because we spend a lot of time trying to convince prosecutors that this is not a case that they want to indict and that they shouldn't bring a criminal action against this person for a variety of different Mm -hmm. reasons. It can be because they're innocent and the government just has it completely wrong. It can be because we think the government's theory is not lawful, that they couldn't succeed even if they were right on the facts, or that our client has something to trade. They don't want our guy. They want a bigger fish Mm -hmm. and they shouldn't charge our guy. He can help them and they can build a bigger case. Let's say I'm a rich dude. Let's say. Or let's say I've become rich perhaps through nefarious means. And I've been now called out. <laughs> right. um, am I calling up my buddies saying, hey, do you have a good, like, how do they find you? I'm very proud of my firm. And one of the reasons is that, you know, 50 years ago or so, white collar crime was, or the white collar criminal practice was kind of seen as something that the major firms wouldn't do. Hmm. And the fellows that started our firm did that and everyone saw what a practice they had built up. And now, Pretty much any big law firm in New York or in the country will have a white collar criminal defense wing. So they really pioneered that Got space. It. And so word of mouth is most, we don't really run any, by really, we don't run billboards. <laughs> You're not going to hear a jingle on the television uh-huh. with our firm name. 
it's all word of mouth. And a lot of it is referrals from other attorneys. Got it. So they, they call you up and say, I'm going to bind. Yes. What is your mindset? Is it, I have to assume they're guilty and find a way to defend them. Is it, I view this as a collection of evidence, evidence against a adversary's collection of evidence and we will now do battle. Like what is your, how do you think about that initial intake of a client and information? The first thing is just getting your bearings so that you can give good advice. I have no idea what happened on the front end until you speak with them and then you need to look at documents and figure out. You really don't make an assessment of the case until you've had a chance to look through things. And sometimes people will come in and right off the bat, they'll say, I messed up. Like, (laughs) you gotta (laughs) help me. And then the question is, what does the government have? Have they learned about this or that Mm -hmm. yet? How can they learn about it? Are they going to learn about it? And so you, you really don't approach it with, they definitely did it or definitely didn't Mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people who come to us who didn't do anything wrong. And there are some allegedly who have come to us that did. I haven't seen it yet, but. Uh, So they come to you and you start going through the information. Let's say the government finds out that you guys have been retained. Yeah, usually we tell them. Okay, we've been retained. Usually we call them because then the the attorneys aren't going to talk to our client directly. There's a rule that prohibits that. What is that communication and over what time period does that look like before either the next stage of, I'm guessing, a settlement and or going to trial? Yeah. So you talk to them and you figure out how your client is situated. If you saw on the news today, Trump just got a letter that said he's a target. A target of an investigation means we think you did it. We're coming after (laughs) you. (laughs) Subject means we think you were involved and you probably have some criminal exposure. Okay. But we're willing to, depending on how things go, if you're situated there, you might be in a position to get a plea deal or to cooperate. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why would you ever tell someone, we really think you did it and now we're going to try and find out if you did? It feels like you're setting yourself up for failure. A lot of times they will wait. There'll be a long investigation that goes Mm -hmm. on before they ever make a determination on who is a target, who is a subject. And then the third category is witness. So we think you have information, but we don't think that you did anything wrong. And the reason that they share that is because a witness might be willing to talk to them and share information. Once the investigation is public. No, even uh, even beforehand, if the U.S. government comes to you and says, we hear you've never gone to jury duty, <laughs> despite being Jesus called Christ. many times. I haven't been called, Josh. <laughs> allegedly <laughs> not having been called many times as a, what, 34-year-old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've never been called. Um and they want to talk to you about it, mm-hmm. and you call me, I would say, no, you can't talk. Do not say a word to them. Let me talk to them, because whatever you say is going to be used against you. That's because you're a target, and they're going after you. Mm-hmm. Now, if they called me outside of being a lawyer, and they said, hey, have you ever heard Colby say that he hasn't done jury duty? I'm a witness. I haven't done anything wrong. So I can talk to them without any risk. Or can you choose to not talk to them without any risk? Sure. But if they may call me, they may subpoena me eventually. And in the grand jury, I would have to say something and they might subpoena me to trial. And then I definitely would. Got it. And so designating someone tells them a little bit about what kind of protection we need to provide. So if you're a witness, you can probably talk to them. If you're a subject, we may need to work out some sort of immunity agreement Mm -hmm. before I'll let my client talk to you. And if you're a target... We're probably not talking to you. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Bit of a Trump sidetrack, as can happen. So the communication, uh, you're now talking to the government. Over what time period and what are you sharing back and forth? So it depends. If we genuinely believe that the government got it wrong, so they think that someone insider traded and we think that they just got it wrong, we'll go collect our own evidence. We'll talk to our client. We'll talk to other people. We'll gather documents and we'll say, Your investigation has been looking at this through like a peephole. You haven't seen the full picture and here Mm -hmm. it is. And it shows why this wasn't something that was illegal. This is why our client didn't do anything wrong. And they'll say, thank you. That would have been so embarrassing if we had charged him. And they will walk away. And so there are times where we will go in and as attorneys present a rebuttal case to the government before there's ever been a charge. This is before anything is public. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of our cases are resolved before it ever gets out. Sometimes you may try and talk to them about what a plea would look like if, if they were to charge the case. And sometimes you don't talk to them at all because you know it's going to go to trial and you don't want to give them a single idea of where your mind is at on the case. Okay. So this, this is an obvious comment, but at the very beginning spe- uh, part of the spectrum, you could not do anything wrong. And all of a sudden the government says, we got you. And you're like, what the heck? But I still have to pay someone to go to them and say, no, 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 I didn't do it. Oh, sorry, my bad. But I'm still out of pocket. All those thousands, hundreds, millions of dollars. I don't know how much. Meanwhile, if you don't have a lawyer or have a good lawyer, you might end up in jail because you just can't fight back. That's not always true. Sorry, if, but the if you have a lower quality lawyer, you could end up in jail for something you didn't do purely because they didn't have the resources or wherewithal to create that broader context you mentioned? Uh, correct. I, I think that it's no big secret that the rich are much better off uh, in the justice system than the poor. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those reasons. Having people come in early look at everything and start crafting the narrative Mm -hmm. of how you're going to present the case from way before it's even charged is very important and advantageous. And not everybody has that opportunity. If that's the one end of the spectrum, the middle part of that spectrum is you might talk to them because it might, because there might be a plea deal and then you don't talk to them all. So how do you get a sense of why you would like, oh no, this is definitely going to trial. How do you, how quickly do you know that? Because the quicker you know that, the less you've shared, so you're better off. Like, how do you think about the plea versus trial outcome? Well, you talk to the prosecutors, you get their view on things. And if they seem to know everything you know, you maybe you're not going to convince them that they're wrong just by arguing with them. Mm -hmm. If you can find a fact that shows that there was nothing untoward going on and nothing was wrong, and you bring that to their attention, you might have a chance of convincing them. But if we both agree on the facts, but I think I'm going to win at trial and you think you're going to win at trial, there's really no sense in us arguing beforehand because I'm not going to change your mind. And that's a situation where you maybe don't talk to them or you don't provide what we call a proffer. You don't give them evidence or outline why you think that they're incorrect. You as a lawyer have an obligation and... (laughs) A big obligation, but you don't necessarily have the same motivations or incentives as your client every time they, yes, no one wants to go to jail. Everyone wants to get up scot-free in terms of how much you can trust and how much you have to verify what your client is telling you. And if they're even giving you the full picture or are they giving you misleading information, how do you balance that transfer of information? Well, I think that it's one, you always have to verify. I mean, it's natural to be scared in these situations and to present the best, the information in the best light. Mm. The people who are going to do best are the ones that are forthright with their attorneys because their attorneys can't share it Mm. and it always helps us prepare. But there's that situation. And it's also digging through, I mean, it's an email centric world now, Mm -hmm. especially in, you know, white collar shops and So you're going to be digging through emails and text messages and helping confirm whatever the person is saying happened, happened. Do you have like investigative people on staff to verify the information? What's that workforce as a part of the firm? I mean, we will hire actual investigators from time to time if we you know, need them to track somebody down or Mm -hmm. go and find something. But a lot of times we are the ones doing the investigation. So we um, get our client to give us all their emails, every text message. And then we start running searches through them to find out everything that happened on X day or on X topic. And you start to put together what the paper narrative looks like Mm -hmm. and what the story is. And if they match up, then you get a pretty good narrative of what's going on. And if they don't, you have things to talk about. And so you're going to trial. You said, all right, we're now going to walk into a courthouse, who are you trying to convince of a certain thing? Uh, Like what, (laughs) is it like 12 people? Is it a judge? What exactly is your audience? Well, it can be both. So if 
there's no resolution at the investigation uh, stage and you get into court and it looks like you're going to trial. First, we're probably going to make a bunch of motions saying what uh, we're going to say that the search was unlawful, that they can't use the things they seized because they went about it in the wrong way. or Just was, because or because that's true? Because it was protected by the Constitution. And as a criminal defense attorney, we a lot of times are just protecting against government overreach. And so if Got they it. step out of line, that's where we step in. And, and so you will do all this legal jostling in the beginning in the court. And so you're trying to convince the judge then of the legal side of things. This was wrong. This was wrong. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, if you're not successful there and you do walk in for a trial on a criminal case, it's going to be in front of a jury almost always. And you are trying to convince 12 people, Interesting. 12 so, everyday people. Just not me. Not, <laughs> allegedly not Colby, but many, many other people who adhere to their legal obligations. So this whole concept of what is guilty, I find fascinating. And obviously it's so easy to be like a white collar lawyer is just defending rich dudes who should be going to jail. When really what you just said and maybe there might be some aspect of that. It is about the U.S., whenever they go after someone, needs to follow a set of rules. And if they don't follow those rules, then good lawyers will find out where they slipped up and the thing they wanted to accomplish can't get accomplished. That's right. And so then you are basically, the person who did the wrong thing should get the full punishment if everything was followed and everything was true that was said. That's the ideal outcome, if you will, right? If someone did something wrong and should they be punished, I think that's an unobjectionable part of our constitution and justice and society. Mm -hmm. But I think that the far bigger problem is when the government starts overstepping things because they're the ones that are supposed to be upstanding, objective, applying the laws without passion or prejudice. And and it's more problematic when the government starts stepping on people's rights than it is mm -hmm. when somebody did something wrong and the government kind of screws up their own prosecution. Interesting. So it's not to say that white collar lawyers are, are the white knights of the U.S., but basically anyone who is a defense attorney in any in yeah, any this part. This is not limited to right. white collar. No, any criminal defense attorney. Anytime this comes up, are looking for these types of things, these types of motions, because it really is to protect people's constitutional rights and make sure those are mm -hmm. upheld. Now, just because the search warrant was faulty and it gets thrown out and they can't use that evidence, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, game over every time. Mm -hmm. There are many instances where, okay, now they can't use the things they got from that apartment, but they can still use witness testimony. They can still use the evidence they got from the phone, it, it doesn't always end the case. But there are times where they charge cases on an invalid theory. So got it. This is where white collar crime, white collar criminal law is so much different than other ones. In a regular crime, murder, mm -hmm. you either shot the person intending to kill them or you didn't. Okay. It is way more black and white. Mm -hmm. White collar criminal law has so many shades of gray. So even if we agree on what happened, it might not be illegal. I think fraud and these different concepts are things that aren't always black and white. Running up an advantage is something that butts right up against fraud. And so did you cross the line? Did you not? Right, right. It becomes very, very close. And so there are times where we say to the government, we completely, uh, that is exactly what happened here, <laughs> but you can't do anything about it. Because it, that, of your own laws. Uh, yeah, because the laws that we have don't make that conduct illegal. Mm -hmm. And so it, he didn't break the law. It doesn't matter if you don't like what he did, if it was unethical or immoral or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter because he didn't break a law. I find this fascinating because I think it is so easy, especially in the financial world, these extremely rich people making even more money illegally trading off information that normal people didn't have. And you view those in a vacuum and you're like, that person should go down. When really, if the approach to take him down opens it up for 
normal people to then wonder why they got screwed over and why they can't fight back. Well, it's because we allowed it to happen here. So now it's happening here. It almost expands the, the state of play beyond what most people would think is fair. But when you're looking at a rich person, you're like, they deserve everything they get. I've never actually thought about the ramifications of the whole system, even though you so want justice for that one person. Yeah. I mean, you really have, to, if you're going to protect rights, you have to do it all the way up and down the spectrum because once you start letting in exceptions for one, mm -hmm. then it's going to start to fall for everybody. And I think there are some cases that are more black and white than others, but there are a lot of times where you, you just don't know if it was mm -hmm. a business guy taking a really strong approach and in, taking an advantage, or if it was somebody uh, who was committing a crime. So now that is your job to convince 12 people who might not have ever even heard of the Wall Street Journal. That's right. And you are, if insider tra uh, trading is one of the more popular, you have to go through financial minutia or how do you think about taking the incredibly intricate parts of this and making it accessible to a point where you get the result you want? Well, first of all, the burdens on the government. So they, oh, need to, <laughs> they have to wade through the minutia. I'm perfectly fine to leave things a little complicated sometimes. <laughs> But yes, you're speaking to folks who might not have a lot of financial training or education. And so I think in that situation, the people who are the best trial lawyers are ones who could explain an extremely complex topic to anyone who could sit down and just say, here's what you need to know about this or that in a way that they can digest and understand. But in white collar cases, it can be incredibly complicated if you're looking through thousands of loan documents mm -hmm. and looking at, you know, how the market was affected on a certain day and what fluctuated where. And I mean, it can be incredibly complicated. Yeah. We've seen all the movies of these and it, I don't know if, well, it's because of John Grisham because he was from the South. Like we always see these real slow talking like lawyers and judges and these like beautiful mahogany or That's whatever right. courtrooms. And then jury duty comes out like a couple months ago and just pops everyone's bubble like this place sucks. Right. And I can't imagine being stuck here in the courtrooms that you operate in. Paint the picture of what it is you walk into on trial day. So we mostly practice in federal court. Most white collar crimes are under federal law and usually they're the ones that bring the cases. And so we're in federal court. Most federal courts are very nice, actually pretty modern here in New York. The courtrooms are very nice. Are you down on the Epstein one um, in Chinatown? I, you said Epstein and I just wanted to immediately say no. Um, <laughs> I, mean, the one, I, didn't know, I don't know where you're going. But the one um, uh, where he where he came out, like he, it's right near the jail where he was kept down in Chinatown. Yeah, 500 Pearl is okay. one and then the Thurgood Marshall courthouse is the other. They're both down there yeah, yeah, yeah. on Pearl Street and Worth. Beautiful courtrooms, very mm -hmm. modern courtrooms. So no mahogany and no old sheriff with a toothpick in his mouth. <laughs> but yeah, most time people don't want to go to jury duty. But most jurors, I, I think, genuinely enjoy the trial after they've been able to do it. You learn something. Yeah. You get to be a part of the justice system. And who doesn't like standing in judgment of their fellow person. It's just all tea, you know, it's all gossip. <laughs> and what do you think about this guy? And it's performance, it's right. drama. Well, the performance and drama, this is like what we see in movies. We see a Matthew McConaughey. We saw Keanu Reeves in Devil's Advocate, but right. I wouldn't say he's the, the top movie lawyer I've ever seen. And we saw yeah. Matthew McConaughey again in Lincoln Lawyer. This guy loves being a lawyer. That's right. He's got nothing on my cousin Vinny. No, but, but that's, that's certainly a different brand of justice. Um, so what is the performative aspect of what you see in the courtroom relative to what you've seen in movies? Well, it is, it is tamped down quite a bit. In the movies, it is so, there's surprise witnesses, there's documents the other side hasn't seen. In a really old movie, Inherit the Wind, the defense attorney calls the prosecutor to the witness stand to talk about surprise the, to talk about what's in the Bible. Uh, it, like it, there are so many things that do not happen. Mm -hmm. The lead up to a trial 
there is so much required exchange of information that you generally know who we get a witness list from the government. Mm -hmm. We know who they're calling. There's a lot of discovery they have to produce to us about each witness, like documents and what they've said in the past and different things. We know the order that they're going to come in. It's very rare that there's this aha surprise uh, <laughs> person bursting into the courtroom. It, it's much more planned out and methodical. All right. So you might know who's coming, but I'm guessing the egos of, all right, sorry, I'm not, I'm not guessing. I'm taking this from TV <laughs> and movies. The egos of lawyers, both, let's say, billions, you're sure. looking at lawyers who consider themselves gods. Sure. I'm guessing the egos in the private sector are quite high. But like, how much, what's the swagger? What's the feel? What's the sharkiness? Like, what, what do you, is it two boxers going at each other? Is it two fencers? How do you view the analogy of what you're seeing in that courtroom? One thing I will say is the criminal defense part is actually the more civil to each other than hmm. the civil bar is. The civil bar is entirely uncivil okay. because it's unsupervised. It, what does that mean? So whenever you go into a civil case, you file a complaint, you go out. Is this like and, Judge Judy? Uh, kind of. Okay. Kind of. Uh, you file a case saying they stole my money and they owe me this money back. And the judge says, okay, go out and under the, you know, the federal rules, exchange all the information you need to do, do depositions, but basically play on your own. And so it's just, that's a boxing match. And, and people are just swinging constantly. The criminal side... The government has all the power and we have very little and, and they realize that we're going to make every argument that we can be, because our client is faced with prison time. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty cordial most of the time. Like sometimes maybe not <laughs> things can get a little out of hand, but I would say it, it feels like very smart, very intellectual people jostling. It's more like fencing than boxing. It's, it's like a uh, debate club almost. It's way cooler than a debate <laughs> club, first of all. <laughs> Don't put down um, debate clubs. <laughs> sorry to everyone who debates. That's not what I meant. Um, but it's way cooler than debate club. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it, there are different aspects of various competitive things that come into play. Debate, I think that various sports service, good analogies, mm. but you're trying to outsmart people in the way you present the case. And then there's a performative aspect where you have to present that in the easiest way to digest for the jury and also in the most likable way. So they like your side better than mm -hmm. the other. I mean, that you hear all the time about someone being right and losing mm -hmm. because the other lawyer was better. And so picking up all of those skills is kind of necessary to do that. And you're also dealing with what the jury has come to expect a lawyer should be they're from so, movies, right? They're so disappointed. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you never have someone come in and pass you a note from the hallway and then you turn and wait for the surprise witness. Um, you don't have Tom Cruise bringing in all of those flight crew members who mm. were going to testify that they had no idea what he was talking Is about. Is A Few Good Men just the go-to law movie for lawyers? I think that it would be split between A Few Good Men and My Cousin Vinny. Really? Because you've really been leaning in on My Cousin Vinny. It's a, it's a great movie. And actually has some pretty, some of the examinations in there are actually pretty real life. Him being held in contempt about 16 times or something <laughs> doesn't really Wouldn't happen fly. in the real world. But yeah, I think that, that people have come to expect certain things and a lot of them are wrong. Okay. So going back to, I think some people did like the movie. It's watchable. Keanu's not very good. Devil's Advocate. He's right. brought up from the South. It was Charlize Theron's first role. I think first role. Oh, I she didn't did know great. that. Yeah, yeah. It looked like it was his first role. It also didn't think <laughs> that. So he's brought up by Al Pacino's firm, sure, for jury selection, and he's got some sixth sense about you shouldn't pick that guy for whatever yeah. reason. And you've seen that trope a lot of times in law movies. Some sixth sense about no, 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 no. I'm really good at knowing who's going to screw you, who isn't. When the jury selection part happens, how involved are you guys actually, and how does that actually work? So there, the sixth sense is science. Um, and uh, let me explain. Okay, please do. We, uh, on cases where you can do it, which generally means you have the funding to do it, 
you will do focus groups where you'll bring in hundreds of people and present your case and see what works and what doesn't. You'll do mock trials in front of people that they bring in that your jury selection consultant brings in and you'll see what works, what doesn't. And you start to form profiles from the way the different people think about the case that you've presented. And you start to find out, okay, school teachers under the age of 25 are more amenable to our client. Firefighters over the age of 40 don't like our client. Like this profession really likes us. This one hates us. This age group, uh, you know, uh, on and on. That's incredible. And so by the time you get there, we have a profile and you get, the jurors get asked some questions and biographical information. And so we have our jury consultant and he'll say, no, no, no. Whenever you hear all of the things that point in the wrong direction. So Keanu is not a gut feel. Keanu is... He's a scientist. He's a sci- He's a social <laughs> scientist, a behavioral scientist. That's completely right. Oh, that's wild. And it, you said if you have the funding. So depending on who you're representing and how much they can afford and how big they want to go and how big the charges are against them, that all depends on what your quote unquote funding would be. Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly expensive to, to hire jury consultants. And we have lots of clients, you tell me, if they have a civil case that's less than $500,000, you can't try it. It's too expensive. Got it. You'll eat all of your money in lawyer's fees, which we're happy, happy. <laughs> eat up. But yeah, you can't go through a trial at these rates where people are charging 700 to $1,200 an hour preparing for, uh, you know, weeks or months before mm-hmm. the trial and spending all that money. Sometimes they can't do it. And what about the government side? Are they doing the same exact thing that you guys are on the jury selection side? I, I don't think so. There may be some cases where they have done that, but I, I don't really think so. I think the, the government has been doing this a long time. <laughs> they know which uh, people are going to favor the prosecution, which ones don't. Um, they may have picked up Keanu Reeves' uh, sixth sense. Uh, but I, I think there are some... There are some generalities that people understand as a juror that'll be good for the prosecution or the defense. You know, ex-law enforcement, Mm -hmm. somebody used to be a police officer or is a police officer, they're probably going to favor the government side. Taxi cab drivers, they don't believe anybody. They favor the defense. (laughs) You've now selected your jury. Yep. Both sides have agreed. What's that? You always see this whole, like, I'll play my card here. Like, how many card, how many vetoes do you have? Well, it depends federal or state court. But in general, they're going to put 18 people in the box. You're going to cut it down to 12. You'll do that 15 times over. And I, wait, why would you do that 15 times over? Because there's 100 people in the jury room waiting for selection. and You have to cull it down to 12 plus four alternates. So you to get 12, you look at 100? Yeah, That's uh, like a, okay. give or take. Got it. So you both agree you both walk into the courtroom the first day. Is it, I mean, opening statements, that's the thing? You walk in, you're going to, uh, the judge will come in, they'll bring the jury in, and then mm. it's opening statements. Government gets to go first. So they say the facts. You're not supposed to argue during an opening statement. What this would is, you argue? This is another thing that is wildly incorrect. <laughs> you're supposed to say, you know, on this date, this happened. And this evidence is going to be shown at trial by this person and this person. It's very factual. Mm -hmm. And what you're not supposed to do is say, this is motivated (laughs) by an improper government who hates these people. He was greedy. Yeah. You're not supposed to be trying to do that thing. There is. Are you allowed to? No, you'll get an objection and the judge will tell you. Got it. There are ways to kind of sneak an argument into the opening statement, but you move there. The government starts putting on their case. So they call witnesses and do direct examination. The defense steps up and does cross-examination. You do that until the government finishes its witnesses. And then the defense can put on a case, but doesn't have to. And then you go to... So what do you mean, can put on a case? Well, the government has the burden. So if, if they have not shown that my client committed a crime by the end of their case, we may not do anything. We may sit down and say... They have not shown you that this one thing happened. So you, um, you actually can't vote on it as a jury because they're not saying anything happened? They may have 
the government may still be convinced that uh-huh. that there was something that was wrong, but the evidence might not support that. And if we don't think that they've put on a strong case, it may not be worth it to us to introduce a counter narrative where the Got jury's going to say, I either believe them or I believe them. Then you're arguing you have to believe my story. If you don't put on a case, you're just saying the government hasn't done enough to prove it to you. Got it. You don't have to believe me. You don't even have to think about what I think happened. But they had to prove these four elements of the crime and they forgot one of them. Or Their house prove- is unfinished. That is right. They've proven everything except, you know, that it was actually fraud or that Got the it. information was material and non-public. And hey, there are lots of different ways this could come up. But um, a lot of times you will tell your client, I mean, the client always has the choice to testify, but doesn't have to. And sometimes the best choice is to have them not and not put on a case at all. So the whole witness versus evidence, obviously, again, going back to the movies, it's better for movies to have humans saying things. Sure. So there's a million witnesses and one of them loses their shit or starts crying, or whatever. It sounds like you might have fewer witnesses relative to just fun diagrams of what actually happened. What does that look like? Most evidence, almost all evidence comes in through a witness. You can agree with the government that certain things will come in, but no, most things do come in through a witness. So you have someone who's up there describing the diagram or... Because that's better for the narrative than a diagram. The rules in the United States have... There's only certain ways you can get evidence in. You can't just say... The government can't walk in and say, this is an email we found. What? You have to get someone else to say it for you? You got to get somebody from the company and say, yes, they got this email from us and it's correct and accurate. But you have... It's literally printed out and you found it on their computer. You can't just say, yeah, this email happened. We're done. How do you know where that email came from? So there is actually not a implicit trust in anyone in this courtroom. No. Oh, that's wild. So you got to call someone that says, yes, they, the government called me. They asked for our emails. I produced them in exactly the way they were on the computers. Because what if something happened between, you know, A and B to that email? What if somebody tampered with it? So you can only get the email into evidence through a witness or sometimes through agreement. So if you get called to the stand, I can say, did you send this email on August 3rd? And you'll say yes. And I'll say, is it a you know true and accurate copy of that email? And you'll say yes. I'll ask the judge to put it into evidence. And after that, I can, ar- I can hold it up. I can argue it to the jury. I can send it back to them whenever they go to deliberate. But it can't enter the conversation and the jury can't know about any piece of evidence unless it's entered through the corroboration well, or... it has to be authenticated, uh-huh. which means you have to show me that it is what you say it is, that it comes from the place you say it does. Usually that's through witness testimony. Mm-hmm. And then there are a, a lot of evidence rules on what can be admitted and what can't. Are you learning anything new from that witness at any given point, or are they purely just a corroboration device for what you already know? If you're the government and you're putting on the case, you know every single thing they're going to say. Don't ask a question you don't already know the answer to. Don't ask. And there are funny stories that I've heard. My boss had a a trial a long time ago, a really big trial that was getting a lot of press and and it was a big thing. And the prosecutor never spoke to the coworkers of the defendant. He'd never spoken to them before the trial, but he calls them to the stand and says, tell me your name. And one after another, they say, the defendant is the best person I have ever <laughs> met. And and he didn't know what they were going to say. And that was the problem. But yes, a good attorney, when putting out a case, you know what everything that every single person is going to say before you walk in the door. But you don't. I might not. Are you still going to ask a question of the government's witness that you might not know the answer to? Generally, the the best practice is not to. Sometimes you're in a situation where you have to, but the best thing to do is to avoid it. When you're cross-examining someone, I am not saying what happened after that on that day. Mm-hmm. I'll say, you said it was dark that day, right? And you say, yes. And then I just move on. And later I'll argue to the jury that you couldn't see well because it was dark outside. And so that you pick out all of the pieces of information that favor your side or show that the witness's credibility isn't good or that their perception was off and you highlight those and Mm -hmm. then you sit down. 
are the objections again like a fencing match like i wonder if i can get away with this objection and i may as well do it or are there is there a actual you can't just object like on the fly whenever you want like how do the whole what's the strategy objection of objections and why do they exist yeah well again the media has ruined people on this (laughs) because you constantly hear uh objection argumentative objection badgering i have never heard either of those (laughs) things used in court um and i can't really imagine a great situation unless someone was like actually badgering i don't know what badgering would be (laughs) no they're based on the rules of evidence so if the prosecutor says what did so and so tell you about the defendant we jump up and object and we say that's hearsay can't tell well, you would jump up you would physically I, jump I would leap to the ceiling no i would calmly stand up and objection your honor um, is that the voice you'd use uh it's a little more british when i do it in court i don't know why but you say objection and it's uh you calmly work it out with the judge mm-hmm. it's far less bombastic Got and it. it's really over you juries get very excited when they see it for the first time like oh like this is got him this is real this is but after a while attorneys that tend to object too much just slow Mm -hmm. everything way way down and the jury gets annoyed by it they really don't like it near the end of the trial and so as now that we're nearing time it's just it's beautiful we can just end it with this arc the jury comes out and they say there's one guy who one one woman who says i'm gonna hand this verdict to the judge it's walked over by the security guard or whatever and he reads it saying he's been found not guilty he's been found guilty if it's guilty let's assume everything i said was correct even if it wasn't is there a sense of devastation or is there a sense of we're just going to appeal this isn't the end of the road so I'm going to give the like most hated lawyer answer of all time. We can cut it. It's it fun. depends. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're not cutting that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, like it is the client's choice to go to trial. They have that as a constitutional right. And I can tell them 500 times before trial, we are going to lose. What other choice do they have? To they could plead t- the same thing? Well, you, to take they a plea could plead deal? and you can work with the government to uh, make sure that it is, you know, a little bit lower there there are a lot of different reasons that uh are kind of technical that i won't go into now but you can get a better deal by pleading okay more uh, often than not uh, or in, always in general okay um or at least that's where the better odds are for sentencing is that if you plea, you're probably going to get a better sentence than if you go to trial but some people just are unwilling to say that they did something wrong it, it's I don't know if it's pride or they're just unwilling to admit it to themselves or to other people, but they won't do it. And so you walk in thinking, we're going to make the government fulfill its burden. And if they mess up, then we'll jump on it. Mm -hmm. But the guy's probably going to lose. So, and then you, yes, you never, I hate losing. I hate losing more than I like winning. So it doesn't feel good in any situation, Uh but uh, yeah, you look to next steps. Maybe they did mess up and you have something for appeal. I think that it kind of depends on the way your client's situated. And then final question, and this is not a softball. This is, (laughs) it is a softball, Um, but also just to get a sense of what makes someone good. Why are you good at this? Why is your firm good? What, what does being good mean? I think being good means spending the time it takes, which can be a lot Mm -hmm. to really drill down and then having both the intellectual capability and the the mentors and the people who have been doing it for a really long time to counsel you and that way you can execute on whatever information you found so having the people that i work with who've been doing this for 50 years where i can say hey i'm thinking of doing this and they say that's a great idea you're a terrific lawyer or mm-hmm. i say i want to do this thing and they say that is idiotic you're <laughs> gonna get disbarred so i think i think our firm is good a lot because of experience, but they're also just inherently smart and good at speaking to people. I think those are all things that make very good lawyers. Josh, this has been awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Josh Bussin, a litigator, whatever that means. Hopefully we know by now. Uh, (laughs) Awesome having you on. Yeah, appreciate it. This has been Colby Howard Wants Your Job, and we found a heck of a lot about what Josh does with his day. Till next week, have a great day.